Well, tonight I want to talk to you about what do you know? What do you know? And let me just say that most of us think we know more than what we really do. There's an actually a real problem with that. It's actually very, a very dangerous thing because when you think you know more than what you do, then you're not open to learning anything. Have you ever gotten into a church service and your pastor started to preach on something and you thought, oh, I know that. I know that. I know I have. Oh, I've heard that. I've heard that. But you know what? Just because we've heard something doesn't mean that we know it. And one of the things that we don't understand is there's a lot of varying degrees of knowing. There's barely getting to know something, and then there's knowing something as a revelation that becomes a deep part of you that is worked into your behavior. And one of the things that can become an issue as we read and study the Word of God is actually the original language, the Greek in particular we'll talk about tonight, has a lot of different words to describe something that we all translate as one word. Like love, for example, has four different words in the Greek, and it means different kinds of love, like love for a friend, love for a spouse, love for God. But you see, we just love everything. We love ice cream, we love cats and dogs, we love God, we love everything. Well, the word no is very interesting because there's eight different verbs in the Greek, eight different verbs in the Greek that all talk about a different degree of knowing but we translate all of those as to know. And I think it really is worth talking about tonight because in the Greek, for example, to take in knowledge, to come to know, or in some instances to completely know, is all described by different words, but we use it in one way. For example, in Philippians 3.10, when Paul said, I am determined to know him and the power of his resurrection. That verb that was used there meant that he was determined to progress in knowing God. And if you have an amplified Bible, you'll see that he talks there about progressively coming to know God. Matter of fact, it, we're, we're not going to take the time to read it, but it's very clear. However, if you go to John 8, 31 and 32, it says, if you continue in my word, then, or you might, then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. That verb, know, means that you will fully know the truth and the truth will make you free. So let's just think of it like this. If I'm just beginning to know something, that doesn't necessarily make me free. But if I completely know something and I have it by revelation, then that kind of knowledge will override my own carnal mind. It will override my circumstances. It will override how I feel. And no matter what's going on around me, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know, and it becomes a reality in my life. How many of you know the difference in just beginning to know something and knowing it in a deep way that really has an impact on your life? Like I could say to most of you tonight, I could say to this whole room, how many of you know that God loves you? And probably almost every hand would go up. But I can tell you that maybe only half of you, or maybe even not that many, and I doubt that it's that many, have a real deep revelation on how much God loves you. For one thing, the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. So if we really know how perfectly and amazingly God loves us, then we won't live in fear. When you really know the love of God, you don't question His love when you have circumstances that you don't understand. So often when people have circumstances they don't understand or something unfair happens, one of the first things they say is, well, God, don't you love me? Don't you love me? I don't understand this. I feel like God doesn't love me. But when you know that you know that you know that you know, then you're so convinced that nobody could ever take it away from you. You know what? I did not see Jesus die on the cross, and I don't even know how I know, but I know that I know that I know that I know that He did, 
and nothing could ever take that away from me. This is the kind of knowing that Job must have had when in the midst of what sounds like an unbelievably horrible ordeal, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that I will stand with him on the last day. I know that my Redeemer lives. With his children dead and his money all gone and his stock all gone and boils all over his body, he said, I know, <laughs> I know. And I think that it's something that we need to really address and think about because we live in an information age where knowledge is so easy to get. And there's so much of it that to be honest, I have a little bit of a concern that we're taking in all kinds of knowledge but never really getting to know anything. So what would be the test of whether you really know something or not? Very simple answer. If we really know something, then it's always worked into our behavior and becomes part of our life. It's not just something we have underlined in our Bible. You can color in your Bible till you don't have any Crayolas left <laughs> or markers, and that doesn't mean that we know anything. Amen? Now, you're all looking at me kind of like, hmm. You know, you can get one message on your cell phone every morning when you wake up. You can turn on the TV and you can get another message. You can put a DVD in and watch it while you're doing something else, while you're having your coffee. You can put a CD in and you can listen to it in your car. You can get another message on your cell phone at break. At lunch, you can watch something else on your iPad. And thank God for the knowledge that we have. But you know what I've found out in my life? The only way that anything ever becomes a revelation to me is if I study it over and 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 I apply it to my life a little bit here, a little bit there. I see it work a little. I step out a little deeper. And then eventually I'm like, I know that to a degree where nobody could ever take it away from me. And that's what we have to have, especially in the days that we are living in and the days that we're coming into. Anybody preaching the Word today should have a great concern about the deception that's in the earth today. Because it is rampant and it is everywhere. Even the messages that bombard our mind that we don't even realize are coming at our minds can affect our thinking. And the Word of God clearly says that in the last days, the deception will be so great that if God did not shorten the days for the sake of the very elect, that no man could stand it. So I'm going to throw something out to you tonight. I encourage you every day of your life to pray that God would keep you from being deceived. Don't just assume that you're so smart that it can never happen to you. I pray that on a regular basis, God, please help me not to ever be deceived and help me to rightly divide the word of truth. I don't want to be in the ditch one way or the other with the Word of God. I want to know how to rightly understand the Word of God and how to be a balanced Christian presenting Christ to the world in a balanced way where the world doesn't think that I'm some kind of a religious fanatic, but they know that I am totally sold out and committed to a living Savior who lives and breathes and walks in us. What do you know? I'd like to suggest that when we know something mentally in our minds, that we can know it in varying degrees, but not necessarily enough to cause our behavior to be affected by it. William Booth, 100 years ago, he's the man who started the Salvation Army. He said six things that he feared for the church in the future. And I just got a hold of these recently and actually added one of my own to it. So there's seven things that I want to share with you that he said that he was very concerned about 100 years ago. He said, I am concerned that we will see the day in the church when these things 
are going to be a huge problem. And I can tell you that all six of them are a huge problem today. It amazes me what a prophetic word that he had and what he saw for the future. We have to be very careful that we don't allow the Word of God in our life become watered down to the point where it has no real value to us or to where we just think we know all this stuff because we've got big libraries, lots of CDs, lots of DVs, everybody's books. We can run to a seminar every time we turn around, but still yet we're not living the life that Christ has asked us to live. We need to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Amen? First thing he said is that he was very concerned that someday we would have religion without the Holy Spirit. Wow. Well, you know, there are some very religious circles today where you could just almost feel like you were getting stoned if you stood up and talked about the power of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit or being filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. And yet all of those things are talked about in the Word of God. The Bible talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Things that today people would call you a religious fanatic. Things like speaking in tongues, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, laying hands on the sick, discerning of spirits. The Bible talks about casting out devils. It talks about all kinds of things that if you tried to talk about that in a lot of religious circles today, they would throw you out. There, there are certain religious circles that still wouldn't have me. You couldn't pay them enough to have me come to their place and preach. Why? Because I'm still considered to be a fanatical, Holy Ghost female preacher. Well, good for me. The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. It doesn't say you'll know them by their religious doctrine. Amen. It frightens me to think how much people don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And I was even in one setting not too long ago, and it was a lot of younger people that were in ministry. And the person that had arranged this situation for me to talk to these people kind of was sharing with me that if I talked about hearing from God, that that was going to kind of freak them out. <laughs> and you know, obviously, I mean, all you have to do is read the Bible. I mean, the prophets, the apostles, the pastors, they all said, God said, God said, God said, God told me, God said. We better not be ashamed to say what God says. Do you hear me? We have to not be ashamed to say what God says. I did one leadership meeting in one set of circumstances. It's been a few years ago. And I just don't know how to talk. I don't know how to preach without saying, God led me, God showed me, God spoke this, God led me to do that, God did this. Because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. And I don't mean that I've got some kind of a red phone that's a hotline to heaven and I'm hearing audible voices all the time. But when we say God told us something, what we really mean is that we know down deep in our spirit that God is leading us to do a thing or not to do a thing. Well, I lived enough of my life as a believer that didn't know how to hear from God, and I'll tell you who I was listening to, me. My mind, my will, my emotions, and I was a believer, but I was a carnal believer. I was born again, but I walked in the flesh. And I did what I wanted to, when I wanted to. I lived according to my feelings and according to my own thoughts and my own will. You can't have religion without the Holy Spirit and have what God wants you to have. <laughs> and Paul said, and I love this, he said it was his mission as an apostle. Now listen to this, to cause people to obtain and be led by the Holy Spirit. 
So I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit as much as I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Because it's our mission to tell you that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have power available to you. The power of the Holy Spirit is available to you. And there are gifts available to you and good fruit that's available to you. And you don't have to live a pitiful, pathetic life where you march off to church once a week and then act like the devil the rest of the week. Excuse me, but I just got to say what I got to say. And I did that for years. I mean, I would go to church and then go out to lunch with my other friends from church, and we would sit there and gossip about the pastor <laughs> the whole time we had lunch. And don't act like you've never done it. <laughs> well, you know what? There is no way on God's green earth that you could get me to do that now. I don't care what I personally thought about the guy. I would cover him, I would pray for him, and I would have the wisdom to keep my mouth shut. You know why? Because now I know that I know that I know that I know the danger of doing something like that. Oh yeah, we got a lot of religion without the Holy Ghost. For one thing, the Holy Ghost convicts us of sin and convinces us of righteousness. We should be so filled with the Spirit that the minute that we even get mean with somebody, we immediately receive conviction and we know. The minute we even start to tell a lie, we know. No. <laughs> well, anyway, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Religion would be considered church attendance as an obligation, <laughs> following rules and laws in order to be acceptable to God or to feel good about yourself. Owning things, spiritual material that makes you feel spiritual when really you're not. Things like Bibles and spiritual books and having bumper stickers on your car and wearing crosses around your neck and, you know, all kinds of things that kind of say, look at me, I'm a Christian. Look at me, I'm a good spiritual person. But none of that gives an indication that anybody really is walking with God. You say, well, what is the indication? Well, the indication is how we live our life. It's how we treat people. It's how obedient we are to God. I went to church for a lot of years and wasn't led by the Holy Spirit. Didn't even know any. I mean, I knew about the Holy Spirit because thankfully I was taught a solid doctrine of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what, nobody ever told me that I could be filled with the Spirit. I wasn't hearing that part. And to be honest and... I appreciate the foundation that I got there, but when I was filled with the Holy Spirit and started functioning in some of the gifts of the Spirit and God called me to preach, I got asked to leave the church. Yeah, wow. <laughs> the second thing he said that he was very concerned about was Christianity without Christ. <laughs> wow. How in the world could you have Christianity without Christ? Well, I'll tell you, let's, let's just say it a little different way. Christianity without the cross. And I would just like to suggest to you tonight that maybe we should look at two sides of the cross. We should look at the side that Jesus died on for us. And then maybe we should look at it from another angle of how it needs to be applied to our lives. Because we can't forget that Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. The Amplified Bible said, forget yourself, lose sight of yourself and all your own uh, interests and take up your cross and follow me. You might say, oh, man, I don't know if I like this or not. Couldn't you just go back to being funny like you normally are? If we're going to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, then we're not going to get our own way all the time. I'm not called to be comfortable all the time. I'm not called for everything to be convenient for me all the time. And hey, listen, I've got a great life. My life is so 
amazingly good that it scares me sometimes. But I will be very honest with you. Over the years, I've had to do a lot of dying to self. And it was not easy at all. But it has been worth it. And we are just never going to be what God wants us to be if we won't let the Holy Spirit apply the cross to our life. And what I mean by that is being willing to die to self. And in case you think that that's something I'm making up, it's in the Bible in several different places. <laughs> I don't know who I got here but tonight, but obviously you need this. You know, sometimes on Friday night I teach a little... Maybe a little milder word. Because we've usually got our biggest crowd, so the more people you have, you've got more chance of rattling somebody's chain. But... <laughs> but see, I'm actually really concerned that if we don't start standing up and being the kind of people that God wants us to be, that there's going to be millions of people lost and go to hell just because we don't, we're not, we have to hear the word preached in a way that, yes, will comfort us and encourage us and tell us who we are in Christ, but we also have to hear then what we are, how we are to lay our life down and do the thing that he's asking us to do. One may be very glad that Jesus suffered and died on the cross for them without ever being willing to apply the cross to their own life. One may want their sins to be forgiven. They may even ask for forgiveness. Yet they're never willing to turn away from those sins, to walk away from them and live the kind of life that God wants them to live. The next thing he said was that, that he was concerned about was that we would have forgiveness without repentance. <sighs> My gosh. Well, you know, God wants to forgive you for your sins. He sent Jesus to die for you so you could have your sins forgiven. Just pray this little prayer and your sins will be forgiven. Well, yes, that is all true. <laughs> but we can't forget that Jesus also said to the woman, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. Repentance is a willingness. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're, we're going to sin. But once we are born again and we have a new nature, who we are internally is not sinners who have no option but to sin because we have a new nature inside. But we, in order to receive all that God has for us, we must be willing to repent, which means to turn totally around and go in the other direction. See, when you're born again, that doesn't mean that you just kind of take Jesus and tack him onto your messed up life and kind of carry him around in your hip pocket in case you have a big emergency. And then like this little genie out of the bottle, you can rub the bottle and out he comes to solve your problem for the day. It's letting him mess in every area of your life. The next thing he said he was concerned that we would have someday is salvation without regeneration. What does that mean? I'm saved, but I never change. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> You know, you better be concerned if you've been saved 30 years and you're still the way you were the day you started out. <laughs> Which is probably not the case. You probably wouldn't be here tonight if you weren't a little more interested in that. But I'm not only preaching to you tonight, but people all over the world that are going to watch by TV. And I'm very concerned about people who just go sit in religious mausoleums week after week after week after week. And they think because they go to church every week that everything is okay. Jesus didn't die for us so we can have a religion and just go to church. He died for us so we could be radically, radically, completely born again, changed into new creatures that worship Him and love Him and love people and lay their lives on the line to see God's will done in the earth.
When do we really know something? At least know it in a way where it's really gonna impact our lives. How deeply do we need to know something for it to affect, say, our behavior or even how we think? You know, I think very often we tell people to read the Bible, but I really believe that we need to study the Word of God. I don't think we need information nearly as much as we need revelation in the Word of God. Well, this handsome little guy's name is David, and he's 12 days old. He was born two months early, and he weighs 1.6 kilos. You know, if it wasn't for this wonderful home here in Kampala, Uganda, that cares for orphan and abandoned children, he would not have made it. But because of the work that the people here are doing, and we're in partnership with them, many children are having an opportunity for a brand new life. So we just want to thank you for being involved. I think it's a great work. God bless you. Word je wel eens bevangen door negatieve gedachten? Kun je ze niet meer van je afschudden? Laat je gedachtenwereld geen geestelijke schroothoop worden. Joyce Meyer heeft hierover een boek geschreven. Kracht in je denken. Want onze gedachten bepalen wie wij zullen zijn. Bestel het boek Kracht in je denken. 12 power thoughts voor de strijd in je denken nu. Via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel... 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.